Welcome to day two of the third biennial Barry Lawrence Rudin Conference on Photography. Uh, my name is Salim Mohammed, and I'm head and curator of the David Ramsey Map Center and one of the co-organizers of the conference. We are so glad and indeed honored that you could join all join us and I hope you will stay for the rest of the entire conference. Katie? Hello all and welcome back. We're grateful to see you for our second day focused on contemporary critical approaches to indigenous and decolonial mapping. We're very excited to hear today's speakers and are appreciative of their time and their contributions, as well as those of our moderators. We will begin today's event with a land acknowledgement video from Stanford University. Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. In addition, we would like to add that the sponsor of this conference, Barry Lawrence Ruderman Antique Maps, operates its shop within the traditional lands of the Kumeyaay people. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Lishwana Gomer. She is from the Tonawanda Band of Seneca, is a professor of gender studies and American Indian studies and she's affiliated in community engagements and critical race studies in the law school at UCLA. She's also the inaugural special advisor to the Chancellor of Native American and Indigenous Affairs. She is this year's Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Women. Along with several journal and book chapters, she's the author of Mark My Words, Native Women Mapping Our Nations published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2013. Part of Keywords in Gender and Sexuality Studies Editorial Collective. This was published this year. Um, she's also a co-PI on three community-based digital projects, namely Mapping Indigenous LA, which was unveiled in 2015, Carrying Our Ancestors Home, unveiled in 2019, California Native Hubs, which was unveiled this year. The keynote today will focus on her work on mapping urban communities of care in cartographic art practices. Meshwana Goman states in her abstract for her keynote as follows. Recently, indigenous artists have used cartographic tools in an artistic way to revision the colonial landscape, to speak to and against the mass development of native land, approved white supremacist architecture and create awareness of original people's ongoing caretaking in the cityscape. Creating indigenous visibility in urban spaces is a necessary remapping of the city. In our keynote, Mishwana argues that making visible indigenous landscapes unsettle the visual settler terrain that structures ongoing dispossession and these powerful mappings are key as faceless mass development of tribal lands that continue to threaten the ecologies and landscapes of indigenous homes. Artistic uh, renditions of the relationship between the human, more than human, and landscapes are, are affective in nature and thus deep in mapping larger communities of care. She will explore the recent artistic maps of Cara Romero's collaborative Tongya land project, River Garza's commissioned work for UCLA, and Mercedes de Rame's installation at the Fowlers, the map and the territory, alongside more traditional maps that depict the urban development of Los Angeles. So without further ado, Mishwana Goman and her talk, Mapping Urban Committee's Care in Cartographic Art Practices. Over to you, Mishwana. Welcome everybody. I'm excited to be here on a, a, a morning and I appreciate everybody 
for showing up. I am currently sitting on Tovangar or, or Gabrielino Tampa territory. There's a map behind us. Yangna is downtown LA, just to situate you. I'm closer to Caravagna. Um, I am, uh, this is a new piece and a new talk, perhaps not the best to do for such an established prestigious uh, institution, but I have been inspired recently by the artwork uh, of the Gabrielino Tamva and Cara Romero, who's Chimawevi. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna get started. My abstract changed a little bit. I got a little deep into the, the beautiful art of uh, current exhibits. And I, I, I was lucky to go to the release in uh, the National State Historic Park in downtown area as well. So um, we'll see. So I look forward to uh, working with you all and I welcome any feedback you may have at the end. So please don't be shy. So I'll, I'll start with Indians are the singing remnants or graffiti in the words of Leanne Simpson. The forms this graffiti takes are as numerous as our nations, abundant as our ancestors who lived, loved, and passed down knowledge of our lands and histories. Quote, you are the result of the love of thousands, writes Linda Hogan, who beseeches us to listen to the environment, to listen, to see, to feel the environment surrounding us with all our senses. Deborah Miranda, Coastal Esalon and Chumash, reminds us that we are also the result of violent histories in her tribal memoir, Bad Indians, itself a form of Indians as graffiti. A book, this is a book which relishes in the tales of her ancestors who resist and act out in order to survive. This harm and genocide in a settler mapping of worlds too must be attuned to in our surroundings and in, in quote, our bodies that are bridges over which our descendants cross spanning unimaginable landscapes of loss. This is just one of the beautiful lines of how to loss and weave back together or remap our, our way back to the ancestors uh, in Deborah Miranda's uh, memoir. Cartographic mapping through the visual has been part and parcel of the erasure of California Indians, relegated to the small and contained um, past temporal space of a romanticized mission. Anyway, itself, the missions mapping the relationship between Native people and uh, the landscapes that we reside on in California. This paper centers, however, the Indian collective's work and photography of Carol Romero's project, Tomva Land, itself a piece from Wishoyo del Vitre, as well as the works of Gabrielino uh, Tomva artist, Mercedes Dorme. The setting of this project is in the sprawling landscape of Los Angeles or the homelands of the Gabrielino Tampa people who call it Tovanga. I will examine the anti-colonial aesthetics and care practices mapped out in the work rather than present a true indigenous map or an alternative map. Mapping uh, is a history of the, uh, mapping a history of the landscape by creating a new narrative or true narrative or one that seems more authentic is just not enough. As Maori scholar Linda Tawahi Smith states, quote, we believe that history is also about justice, that understanding history will enlighten our decisions about the future. Wrong, history is also about power. In fact, history is mostly about power. A thousand accounts of the truth will not alter the fact that indigenous people are still marginal and do not possess the power to transform history into justice. This is um, from Linda Twehi Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies. The Gabrielino Tamva, who comprise uh, an estimated 2,300 people, do not possess the population power and cannot use the form of voting or a form of democracy to make the change that is needed just by telling their truth. Across California, people are aware of the raw deal, the embezzlement, the genocide, and the so-called uh, lost treaties. In fact, under Eisenhower, recompense was paid out in small amounts to Tongo families of the dispossessed. There is an acknowledgement of this dispossession. There is that, that awareness of that truth. Rather, to continue with the words of Linda Tuei Smith, it is, quote, also about reconciling and reprioritizing what is really important about the past and what is important about the present. Romero and the Indian Collective, made up of numerous tribal leaders, scholars, and other artists did, was to relay and prioritize how they wanted to be seen in their homelands. These 
Billboards invite us in a gift of sharing or what tribal cultural leader Craig Torres related to me as the spirit of Maha, a sharing, gifting or swapping of knowledge. Dora May's beautiful installations and public art spaces reflect Maha. They invite the viewers to think through land from her curious arrangements. The cartographic practices of these California Indians works exemplify communities of care that must be considered when we think through the unmapping of settler terrains. They are about the process of care in that process of mapping. The work of the Indian Collective in Dorme counter a settler commercial map of Los Angeles. Indigenous people relegated by the settler state as expendable and erasable graffiti and are working against capitalist and state ordinances at various scales. Rather than understand this as a subjugated positionality, I posit that graffiti is the critique necessary and valuable to understand interlocking structures of oppression. In the following words of Leanne Simpson that inspired this work on graffiti and thinking through graffiti art or public, these forms of public art as forms of mapping, she says in her poem, I Am Graffiti, erasing Indians is a good idea, of course. The bleeding heart liberals and communists can stop feeling bad for the stealing and raping and murdering, and we can all move on. We can be reconciled except I am graffiti, except mistakes were made. It is these mistakes, this ongoing indigenous inscription on American landscapes that denies the permeability of settler colonialism and exposes the powerful maps of commerce and subjugation and every day how they need to redo and redefine these particular maps in order to sustain that power that Linda Twahey Smith referred to. Graffiti is the memories and practices of gendered forms that undo the evidence of our subjugation, rupture land as merely property, and can undo the separation of humans and non-human. Cultural production and everyday acts of resurgence have the force to undo a colonial unknowing defined by Vilmolisari, um, Pegus, and Goldstein as, quote, produced and practiced in concert with material acts of violence and differential devaluations that are striving to preclude relational modes of analysis and ways of knowing otherwise. That Ms. is- Ms. Yeah. I, I, I hate to interrupt, but wondering, uh, were you intending to show us show slides or is oh, that- Oh, yes, coming? I apologize about that. Usually I have it going first off. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Luckily I didn't get to the artwork yet, so <laughs> we're That's all good. Great. That's good. Okay, it's still on, right? Are we it's all still set? on? Okay, good. I just need to share the screen. Wait. Oh. There we yep. Go. Okay. That looks good. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, where were we here? <laughs> okay. Um, in this colonial unknowing, uh, it's about what counts as evidence. Our art bodies and actions take on the colonial unknowing, upsetting that which is supposed to count as evidence of disappearing or devalued knowledges. Our art bodies and actions are the embodied sovereignty on the settler landscapes meant to erase and eradicate indigenous forms of relationality. The cartographic art productions I discuss here provide ways of seeing indigenous futurities and relationalities beyond the destruction continuously wrought in settler terrains. Dorme's work is nestled in a community of care in the ancestral pole to lands across the urban sprawl that is LA. She literally creates new ways to see the landscape and in doing so at times our own self-destruction as humans. Upon receiving the Indian Collective's Radical Imagination Grant, Romero, who was a longtime Los Angeles resident, although from Chimueve um, tribe, thought critically about absences in the LA narrative and landscape. As she states in her artist statement, quote, the imagery evokes the old aim adage, we are still here. And this of course is from Alcatraz, which sits on Pomo land in the Bay Area. But for these images, she continues, we must center the Tomvo when we say Los Angeles. So these place-based actions and place-based maps are those deep maps rather than thin point maps, which may tell that 
alternative truth or countermapping, et cetera. So the first billboard was Shoyut Alvitre's iconic revision of the Hollywood sign to read Tom Valand begins the series. Nothing says LA like the Hollywood sign iconography to reclaim the recognizable land and space of Griffith Park in this tongue in cheek graphic design begins the larger reclaiming we see throughout the series. And Kara Romero's work, Indian Collective, she takes this co-creation and consultation seriously. These are the processes of care that are mapped out in her work. Significant to these cartographic art practices that reclaim space is a history of Los Angeles in dispossession. Even before Vanguard becomes subsumed under the state of California and the US federal jurisdiction, its history is intertwined with international claiming of property and burgeoning US property law. In California, Tovangar would be divided up into a small number of Spanish land grants, 22, and then later post-secularization into over 200 Mexican land grants acting more as title to property as they did not return to the crown. Land grants could only be passed on, and I, I want this to be clear, between European or Christian nations still. This was done without the consent, and consent is a big uh, point of thinking about communities of care and communities of mapping. How do we consent to these mappings as well? The passing on of land was done without the consent of those who lived on the land since time memorial. Settler regimes were then perpetuated with the registering of land claims in the US domestication of California in 18, um, 1851 with the Public Land Commissions Act. Again, American Indians did not consent, but the title was still passed from that Christian to Christian nation in accord with the doctrine of discovery. These race making and dispossession forms the foundation of the US Supreme Court of Law and property law in the US that relegates indigenous peoples as domestic dependent nations. KSU Park, and this is in keywords in gender and sexuality studies, which is just hot off the press, reminds us that, quote, while the English word property still retains the meaning of a quality or trait belonging to a thing from its old French der derivation, its more dominant use now to signify a thing owned or possession appears to have been rare before the 17th century. During that century, when the English colonization project came into full bloom, the Anglo adaption of this term made the second usage, the parameters of things that could be owned under English law expanded dramatically. And what it meant to own or possess them underwent a sea of change in the colonies. So in fact, slavery and colonization begins that first form of mapping as property rights in the US. The center of US power is property rights the legal that seeks to legitimate conquest and violence, the legal that legislates criminality that in turn will build California. And I'll get to that in a second. Mapping is an essential settler colonial tool to domesticate land in Southern California and propel development to the point where the economy of California is now the fifth largest in the world. And I want us to think about the use of billboards in relation to economies and commerce and what that means. So the 400, my slides here, the 493 hand-drawn diseños maps filled with, filed with the Public Land Commission in 1852 are all similar to the Buenos Aires map that you see pictured here. The Land Act of 1851 established the domestication of California landscape under US governance, providing an avenue to legitimate existing Mexican land rights and map out territory, territory yet unclaimed. Even within the history of these maps and the land claims processes, the land relationships of California Indians in Southern California were not only denied legally, but the mapping process propelled ongoing violence against their bodily survival. So there's a connection between maps and the violence uh, uh, done against bodies. Both violence and mapping ensured California Indian erasure and establishing new and ongoing commerce centers. The scratched out land plots marked by outlines of trees, rock formations and water markers are not the plotted lands of, our Cartesian, of Cartesian accuracy that we have come to expect through um, property title. 
These colonial maps garner powers through military might and brutal dispossession. That has been a large part of the mapping out of, of particularly in these commerce centers has been that brutal and military power. The attempted removal of California Indians, their knowledge systems and their ways of seeing and being with the land is necessary to that mass development and its ongoing snowball effect on the environment. These chicken scratch maps are original property maps, continuing dispossession, even as the plots have been subdivided again and again since this moment. The Desenius Bonus Aries map, which is now the area of Bel Air and UCLA in Westwood, some of the highest prime property real estate in the US, trust me, I know this as a, as a faculty member, is the homeland of Gabrielino Tamva, who continued their relationship with the San Gabriel Mountains and the ocean and all that's in between. Many of these maps depict regions that are the most expensive real estate properties. Newer maps may exist of these properties and they may seem more objective and scientific with better models of scale or more realist representation. But at the core, they still map dispossession. While the Tongva currently do not have a tribal land base or a place to launch their tiots or their canoes, the people continue to have a deep knowledge of place and commitment to protecting all their relatives, the human and more than human in those processes of care. So situated in the borders and boundaries section of the map in the territory exhibit at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, Mercedes Dormes, our land and sky waking up installation acts as a deep map that defies Western concepts of map territory held in the colonial encompassing property logics. And here I, I didn't attempt to butcher the, the Tamva pronunciations here, but wherever in LA, wherever you see NGA at the end of the sentence of a street map, that is the, a, a Tamva name and a Tamva village. So those, those traces are still there consistently. By creating connections to land and community that travel through time in the presentation of collected and stored cultural objects, um, Dorme emphasizes the practice of making ongoing connections to place. The pieces that comprise Mercedes installation were drawn from the archeological collections at the Fowler Museum. In consultation with Wendy Teeter, Sedona Gomenshelsky, and Mitzla Aguilera, they, they all worked on and went lovingly through the boxes that were Tamba items stored after being disinterred through violent processes of development, either development that were private property development and, um, and some public property development that continues to occur. So while remains have been returned, not all the items, however, fall under NAGPRA and the rest on the shelf at the museum, the rest are set on the shelf at the museum at UCLA's campus. In NAGPRA, for those, um, I know there's a lot of uh, people from other countries, is the Native American Graves Protection Act that was enacted in the 1990s uh, in, and um, has yet to fulfill its whole promise of returning ancestral remains. It's a very complicated law, especially in California. Dora May thought carefully about the relationship between these items and placed them on the, the spiral pedestal that we see here in the, in the in the piece. It's quite a large piece and it sets up quite high. Many of these items were from Playa Vista. This uh, development that was that houses and helped to build what is now referred to as Silicon Beach, which uh, takes from, um, which is a, a subset of what is going on in the Bay Area with high rise in pr prices and the, um, major gentrifications, and, et cetera, in that area. This commercial area, and it's very commercial, was developed after NAGPRA, but the disinterment of the Tamva and their ancestors did not stop. Like many whose homelands are in these high real estate zip codes and are not federally recognized. It's not a coincidence that the lack of federal recognition power to stop the unburying rests in these large zip codes also, New York, the Bay Area, Los Angeles. This itself is a mapping of disinterment of um, our ancestors. This removal from the landscape of ancestral presence, over 400 ancestors, did not take place in the far past, but in 2007. They were only recently re-entered in 2018. 
Dorme places prominent pictures of her family that she took at the protest of the development of Playa Vista in her ancestral lands. There are these beautiful large photos that overlook the spiral, uh, watching and caring for the items we see. The, um, the, all of this connotes a portal, a technique often used by Dorme to bring and collapse time and space together. The mitten and star stones are mixed from, with salt from the ocean and pigments from the mountain, signifying and mapping the territory and the spiral itself between, between the ocean and the stars. Mitten and star, um, we do not have all aspects to this legend of the map she is presenting. I see this as a map in this piece, but what is experienced is a pull toward a critical thinking about museums, storage of cultural items, and the feeling of loss of knowledge and disrespect, and the thinking of the ways that mass commercialization has mapped out a relationship to our ancestral items and to the earth from which they're pulled. On the same plane, however, is a remembrance captured in the photos and care of lovingly placing items and renewing connections in the process of doing so. Dorme engages with these traditional cultural items to remap a path back despite this disinterring of cultural objects that continue to happen as development occurs and institutions are built. The physical landscape of her map highlights the unknown through the mysterious cog stones, which she refers to, what she prefers to refer to as star stones um, and, and thinking through the connection with the celestial. So the, it highlights also the known that remains and keeps those lines of connection intact, represented in her trademark of red strings that flow into and out of the frame of the photos and installation. Salt, earth, sky, and memory present a powerful presence in creating the installation of the map of ongoing Tomva presence. This map is a powerful anti-colonial map juxtaposed against the simplicity that we see of the Senyos map. And ask us, and it asks us to question power and place. The settler architecture of Los Angeles created a landscape of immeasurable environmental destruction, propagated violent and racialized property regimes, property regimes that do not just affect native people, but affected other people of color, and, and even that shifted as race changed in the US. In Understanding Fair Housing, a report undertaken by the US Commission on Civil Rights in 1973, Three, they report that by 1940, 80% of the properties in Los Angeles include racial restrictive covenants in their deeds, some of which remain on the deeds even to this day, even if not legal under the law. The need for labor and expansion has always been part and parcel of how race was laid out in Los Angeles and race and the mapping of Los Angeles to where people could live was part and parcel of that. The, the need, um, Kelly Lytle Hernandez in her book, City of Inmates, makes clear the ways that Cajun, the uh, word she uses, enabled the buildup of the carceral systems that would be a source of labor. The Lytle Hernandez starts with the early foundations when native people were legislated into criminality and sold at places like La Plaza where they would be forced laborers. Making vagrants through erasure on the landscape was a key way to build a city of infrastructure. She also, uh, Kelly Lytle Hernandez and her work talks about white male vagrancy, a gendered vagrancy of white males that uh, then also were arrested. And they were the ones that actually built the street of Beverly Hills, uh, Rodeo Drive, a place of mass consumerism and mass wealth that's passed down from generation to generation. So while the diseños and subsequent titles, land lease, leases, racial covenants and legalities create a thing out of Tavangar, again, Tavangar, if you stand on Santa Monica Beach and look up at the mountains, that's Tavangar, which is the, the markings of Tomba territory. So while it creates a thing, they fail to sever tribal relationships to land. Carol Romero's large scale project that spreads out and, and captures the iconic Los Angeles of neighborhoods, enables the viewer to make the scaled connection between erasing Tomva bodies, effacing tribal practices, eliminating tribal structures, and obliterating the original landscapes and that of mass consumerism. 
all failed projects because again, to return to uh, Simpson, I am graffiti. So Romero states on her artist profile that quote, the images in this collection of work made in Los Angeles by both Tomba artists and myself and our living dialogue between California Indians, urban tr Indian transplants, settlers and diasporic peoples. Indigenous forms of graffiti and indeed our very bodies are these anti-colonial tools crafting new cartographies in the wake of mass development. Graffiti is denying settler permanence. Indigenous graffiti is not just about marking territory, but relationality. It's continuing the inscription on the landscape of that relationality. So Romero uses the genre of billboards so often looked for their mass population across the cityscape and familiarity to jar the passerby into awareness. Kolishaw, an Aboriginal scholar, argues that um, in the context of Australia, that Aboriginal acts of social disruption should be understood not as uh, criminality or desperation, desperate acts of people without the capacity for agency, but instead should be read as radical acts of refusal to accept a liberal promise of the settler state. In many ways, I'm saying that we should think through graffiti as also pushing back against that liberal promises as being a generative refusal in cartographic practice. To better understand the relationship between gendered violence and settlement, we must connect the body, the scale of the body, as I talk about elsewhere, to that of quotidian capitalist practices held up by the infrastructure of state capitalism. Indigenous bodies, Tomfo bodies in this case, objects and cultural items are prominently featured, not as a point of commercialism that one might see in a perfume ad, say starring Johnny Depp that we're all aware of, but in full regalia in sublime tones. In Mitzla at Pavangna, she is juxtaposed in full regalia with a set of sunglasses resting just ever so casually on her traditional basket hat at the site of uh, Tamva in Hachiman emergence, Pavangna. There is largely featured an uh, airplane flying over within, um, the, within the, within the billboard and on the billboard. Romero in the Indian Collective are not returning us to a nostalgic past. They're not mapping a nostalgic past here that frankly is unattainable due to the destruction colonization has wrought on the environment, but rather they are claiming the still sacred spaces of creation and that ongoing creation. Mitzla is a touchstone. She is, pres she is present and past folding into the future. The billboards in this one in particular are mapping a road to caring for a place despite the noise and reverberations of mass consumerism. These images here tear back the gritty streets of LA to expose the beauty of Tavangar. I turn to discuss the two other billboards in the series, which also name uh, the Tomva, Tomva woman artist while placing them in particular areas that are meaningful. Here, here the method that is being taken up by both scholars and our activists alike is that of rematriation in a way, we can think of it that way, is key to an analysis of practicing the cartographic art practices of care. As Rematriation Magazine founder, Michelle Shenandoah, whose Haudenosaunee states, rematriation is not just about the changing of ownership or title to title passing, but it is a return to the sacred. It is a return to the earth, which is sacred. Stephen Newcomb used this term in 1995 to talk about a more holistic approach to repatriation, to return a living culture to earth, a living culture to earth. Indigenous practices were all part of creating wellness in communities, according to Newcomb. He goes on to emphasize, as a concept, quote, as a concept, rematriation acknowledges that our ancestors lived in spiritual relationships with our lands for thousands of years, and that we have a sacred duty to maintain the relationship for the benefit of our future generations. Now, since 1995 and Newcomb's work with repatriation, rematriation has kind of become a touch point 
of remapping relationships to land, to water, to life that we see in a lot of indigenous uprising against environmental destruction across the nation and across Canada, really indeed across all of the Americas. Relationship between land and us is key to creating a wellness and return of land practice. The practices of survival depicted in the billboards are key to the practice of rematriation from Washoyot holding a traditional basket close and lovingly, adapting to technology that we see in Mitzel's frame, to plunging into sacred waters for renewal that we see in the Mercedes at Caravagna frame to relishing our remnants from ancestors or returning to the sea, which is, is, is part of Wishoyut's uh, photo that we see here. Each of the Tomba women stand prominently in the monochromatic frame floating in trees or water. In Mercedes at Caravagna, Mercedes Dorme is splayed in a cross configuration floating freely in the freshwater springs at Caravagna, a village site of the Tomba. Uh, this is about a mile and a half from UCLA's campus, and I work there quite often. So when I first saw this image, I laughed as outside the frame and above her is a majestic tree planted by the Spanish to mark, to map fresh water sites on its expedition. This tree also provided the evidence in the, of the Patola expedition and thus enabled the Dormes, Lassos, and, and Barons to register the site as a historic place. And, and um, they quickly established a 501c3, which protects the place to this day as a foundation. And now it's currently under a renewal with indigenous stewardship and has been a site of great connection on the west side of Los Angeles. The springs still produce tons of fresh water daily and are the only protected site under Tomfa control in Los Angeles. They have a lease with LAUSD, however, so this is always precarious and has consistently been threatened by development from such entities as the YMCA who sought to pave over the oak trees and medicine garden for a new facility in the far corner of the University High School campus. In particular for parking, that, that um, <laughs> ever, that, that thing that frustrates most of us living in Los Angeles. That said, the YMCA, I want us to think about, about those liberal practices that were being addressed in Simpson's poem and with Linda Tuehi Smith as well. So Mercedes clear presence and relaxation in this spot is thus so meaningful in understanding rematriation as an embodied sovereignty or an embodied practice where the connection with water is key. Washoyot in a similar vein presents elegant, peace in a floating airiness as she rests over the assemblage of commercial LA. Given the history of non-consent in all its forms, from indigenous women's bodies to the exploitation in taking of land, the act of Mitzla, Washoyut, and Mercedes to so boldly place themselves overlooking large swaths of LA is courageous. Here I think of the work of Deborah Miranda, where she reminds her readers in Bad Indians that um, while the statistic of one in three is a horrible statistic, one in three of Native women um, experience sexual assault and violence, that in the days of California colonization, the statistic was 100% guaranteed that that would happen. So she says, quote, we accept being made invisible as a kind of Novocaine rather than endure the constant grinding of historical traumas that directly targeted Native women's bodies and our ability to express ourselves in language and literacy, says Deborah Miranda. Here she is speaking to the tactic of coping with the violence enacted upon California Indian women. Indeed, the the decision to hide under the category of Mexican at times during um, the Mexican land grant and then later during um, the US takeover was for survival as well. So the refusal here in these billboards to be unseen explodes across the public sphere and demands to be listened to. Romero and the artist pictured in her photography of Los Angeles lay claim to land and our relationship to it in the form of street art that is so public and moving and so bold. Turning land into property through creating it as a commodity and severing the deep relations of the people allowed for its desecration. Mass commercialization of Tavangar was followed by toxins polluting the land. 
in water diverted under cement and the ongoing commercialization in the landscape that continues to harm not just the first peoples, but all peoples. River Garza, Spillboard, a collage of images and graffiti inscriptions, reflects the harm of mass consumerism. The disjointed images and collage of commercial prints with, with writing common to the art of graffiti uh, mark this particular billboard. The street art practices signify Garza's form, and here he, he questions commercialism in his bricolage of images that have created a simulation of the Indian, to employ Gerald Bisner's coinage, and is the, quote, absence of the tribal real. That is, River examines the Buffalo Nickel, the Cleveland Braves, the Washington R Word, tobacco companies, alongside what are often deemed American values, such as blind justice. Through image replay, he points out the hypocrisy of Manifest Destiny through a rudimentary Cupid angel with pointed arrows that draw attention to the written words. This, of course, is to reflect the famous John Gass Manifest Destiny painting of American Progress in, uh, done in 1872. Yet Los Angeles, the city of angels, is also facetiously presented as a city of love by juxtaposing the angel next to the high pollutant oil wells, oil wells that help garner massive wealth within Beverly Hills area and throughout Los Angeles. These oil wells, despite a kind of facade of Hollywood and glamor in the Los Angeles landscape, still exist in poor areas that largely affect people of color. This itself is a mapping of toxin and environmental racism. America as a land of justice is highlighted as anything but, anything but as we see the revolutionary figure of Toporina in the image of Lady Justice. She is masked with outstretched arms, a basket of acorns. Acorns are the uh, traditional food of the Gabalina Tamba. They have high protein content. Toporina led a rebellion against the Spanish colonizers and she paid dearly for that act. Again, she did not consent to marriage, but she was married off to one of the soldiers afterwards. The written graffiti screams on the billboard, demanding to undo a romanticized narrative mapping and unmask as Toporina does in the billboard's upper right-hand corner. It insists that we understand that if the land isn't healthy, we aren't healthy. Or if the land is compromised, we are all compromised. Bringing together the collage, Garza makes a quick note next to the acorn basket. Note, the wealth of the community is gauged by the well health of the land. The roadmap here is clear in this collage, in the genre of the billboard itself. Refocus, rematriate, and rethink the commercial relationships we have with land in the urban landscape. As Tomva archaeologist Desiree Martinez and her co-writer Wendy Teeter remind those who conduct research into Vangar, Quote, an inherent practice within Southern California Native American communities is reciprocity. In the past, reciprocity usually took the form of goods or food given to those in need, knowing that they would be returned to the provider at some future date. Reciprocity not only solidified cultural and social ties, but also ensured cultural and physical survival during times of stress, environmental or otherwise. Community members who had access to the most resources usually gave the most. So we see a different version of interaction relationality taking place in these billboards. Reciprocity in the making of landscapes which advocate for the health of the land and thus us is key to mapping communities of care. What might, what might mapping justice look like if we carefully thought through what measures our relationship with land? How might we rethink a landscape beyond capital chain, uh, capital and, change our, and thus change our relationships to each other? Garza's image is not a whimsical, it's a, a common straight of street art, but rather a complex presentation that unravels the generic Plains Indian landscape. Not only does he question the commercialism of such an image, he's very specific in weaving in Tamba rock in pa painting images. These symbols and forms of art are tied to the earth through story, practice, and imagining the millennial intergenerational knowledge being passed down. Rock art, in fact, shares in its inscription on hard surfaces similar qualities as graffiti form that Garza's images take. It is the earliest form of visualization that often looks at relational modes of being of early humans, 
while also asserting a presence and a refusal of erasure. The visual aesthetics of, hand, of hands or depictions of the cosmos in rock art or even a story in the pictographs provides the early evidence of what it means to be human, to feel, to desire, to be in relationship with each other. Dora May also in her artwork to, to return continually addresses ancestral loss to the violence of colonization and the ongoing settler infrastructures that enable mass development into Vongar. Dorme was taught to be a cultural resource manager by her father, Robert Dorme, and family who have fought relentlessly against powerful development companies in Los Angeles. And for those of you not aware what a cultural resource manager does, it uh, they make sure that remains and cultural items are not unearthed during development and at construction sites. It's an incredibly hard job. You're on your feet all day construction zones can be dangerous and not every construction company is friendly towards a native monitor that's watching these sites. So here I return to Dorme to address her piece, Pulling Back the Sun, a move that illuminates the seasonal changes in equinox and is accompanied as a story of relationality. Dorme tells us that this cosmology of possibilities has three elements. That is the key, the tanga home, the Shievo, the healing space, and Yovar, ceremonial space. Now, this particular piece is at the um, State Historic Park and uh, next to Chinatown in Los Angeles. This is has its own history of indigenous indigenous revitalization and rematriation as a garden site where where the indigenous of, of the Latin American indigenous. Uh, Tamva and American Indian diaspora and others came together and allies came together to plant a garden using corn to up um, to clean up through the use of corn the toxins and soils in the train yard. After they had this done it got turned into a state park and now within that state historic park site are incredibly expensive condos all around this what became this beautiful site after indigenous rematriation. So I'm just going to put that there for a second and going to concentrate on what uh, Mercedes Dorme's piece means here as well. Here we can see the red strings that mark places uh, that mark places in the loose pieces of tarps. We see the ongoing struggle, but most importantly, a determination to maintain and imagine a landscape for future Tomva generations and relationality of that presence that can take place in a park sitting. The altar here uh, is created from uh, bits and parcels of the land around it, and it, 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 it has paintings on it that symbol the batik that we see on the outside here. So when I visited um, people and placed, people were placing their own offerings on the round platform, painted in a similar style as Tomba's ceremonial sand painting. But, it, you know, it was, it was the artist's interpretation of that for the public. The wind wafted through the park and one could feel the breeze with a hint of ocean salt through the holes left of the petite canvas, reminding me of the rock art and sunburst paintings in such important places as Turkua Cave in Catalina or Pimu, which is seen as the belly button of uh, Tamba landscapes. So this piece creates a wonder and a point to reflect on the senses. It is also a place of shelter and contemplation. As I watch people place offerings in silence and without an explanation on the altar, from acorns to miniature dodger balls, it became clear how important it was for strangers to make place in connections. While it is too often the indigenous who are relegated to loss or the lost in a lot of counter mapping even, it became clear that the lack of connection affects everyone. Dorme's piece not only offers a reflection on place, but a place to process communities of care within the park, within that park site. It is at once on an individual scale while simultaneously overlapping with the past, present, and emerging communities of care in Los Angeles. As Dorme relays in her artist statement, quote, and Tamba believes the winter solstice is not about focusing on being the shortest day of the year, but rather on the phenomenon that on this day, we pull the sun back into the sky, signaling the beginning of more light. 
This lens creates a space of positive potentialities and acknowledges the original caretakers of Los Angeles, the Tomva peoples, towards envisioning a more equitable future. So as the California Indian artists reflect here, mapping communities of care in the Los Angeles basin do not just begin with relating a past, but beginning to imagining new landscapes from that which remains. As the precarious items are returned and the land rematriated, communities of reciprocity, relationality, I was reminded through this piece of the words of Deborah Miranda, who says, quote, we think we are too broken to ever be whole again, but it's not true. We can be whole just differently. So to get to this point of wholeness, we must begin to undo the afterlives of covenant codes spoken of earlier. We must map a new way to relate to land outside of plundering and respect water that we cannot live with uh, without in Los Angeles. We must continue to make public spaces that undo the visual terrains of destruction. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll look at, at the chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting for me, uh, me to get on the, on the video. Uh, I'll be there in just one second. Um, while that's happening, I, I, uh, I want to thank you, Ms. Rana, for this, um, uh, this uh, amazing, um, uh, and fascinating keynote. Uh, there's there's just so much in there to unpack, and um, I am uh, I'm going to just go go ahead and uh, go to the questions uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, our first question has to do with um, uh, asking for a name. Uh, one of them is asking. I could not retain the name of the scholar mentioned in relation to the concept, concept of rematriation. Could you please uh, indicate that? Sure. I'll put it in the chat. And Stephen Newcomb, I believe he's a Chickasaw scholar, but don't quote me on that. I get the, seat, the Oklahoma tribes mixed up sometimes, but I believe he's Chickasaw. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, another, um, another question, and I'm really sorry, the, the video seems to be not working. Um, uh, this is from uh, Kitty Parker, and she asks, uh, the artworks displayed as billboards are striking. How does access to high traffic areas, such as roadsides and major museums play into this story? Mm. So she placed them very deliberately in iconographic neighborhoods, but areas of super high traffic, which you know if you live in LA. Um, so how it played out, I believe, was you know so many people were so moved by the billboards as they moved through. People were posting like, "I saw Misla's billboard," or you know, and and I do happen to know the people, but I think it meant a lot because there wasn't a direct commercialized message. It was just this stunningly beautiful pieces of art that that really stood out and jarred one not you know it wasn't the the typical there's a lot of uh, advertisement for streaming lately for instance or cannabis <laughs> cannabis uh ads so um I, I believe what it did is it just made people even more aware of Gabrielino Tomvo which has increased incredibly over the last five years um there's always been quite a large population in Los Angeles of over 70,000 American Indians, which, you know, when you add uh, Pacific Islanders and Latin American indigenous diaspora, LA is pretty much the largest indigenous city that you have. This is what led to mapping indigenous LA. So it's more like, how do we begin to create those relationships between us and acknowledge the presence of that? And that's what Cara Romero in her Indian collective, that was the intent of, of, her, of her billboards and working with Tomva people. And I just think it's an exemplary way to conduct an art project of visibility and presence, presence really in Los Angeles, so. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rana. I, Katie has a, just a follow-up. Uh, she says, 
lots of people are saying she's uh, uh, she's helping them uh, uh, see that. Sorry, let me repeat. Lots of people are saying she's helping them see LA in a new way. Uh, maybe you could comment on uh, the uh, the indigenous mapping of LA digital project. Sure. Um, I got to fix a couple links on my map, but that's the key with digital projects. You're always updating them. Um, uh, so the Mapping Indigenous LA project is I do with my co-PIs, Maylee Blackwell, who worked with Latin American Indigenous Diaspora, um, Julianne Anasi, who's rather new to the project, and she is working on the Pacific Islander map with EPIC, Empowering Pacific Islander Communities in Los Angeles. And then I worked with the Tonga and worked with some of the American Indian orgs in at Los Angeles. Now, LA has multiple histories of indigenous stories and settlement. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that when people moved to, people came before the 1950s Federal Relocation and Termination Act um, and came when Hollywood was first formed. There became a lot of Indians who came as extras and directors and actors and actresses. Um, there, there got to be a point where Italians got to be hired. Michelle Rahij's important work really addresses this in um, reservation realism, if anybody's interested. So uh, what happened is there's just been multiple kinds of people coming and making place here. Uh, what this has meant though for a community as small as the Tamva is that often their voices hadn't even been heard within those indigenous circles or following those indigenous forms of protocol. So really what happened was, you know, I was talking with my colleagues, Keith Camacho is also part of this, he's a Chamorro man. Um, we were talking and we get to relate all the time in academia to each other, follow those indigenous protocols, talk about what's going on globally with indigenous peoples. Um, but the communities weren't necessarily getting to talk. So mapping indigenous LA was really to create awareness of the different communities that were going on and having those interactions. Sometimes I, I you know, I wish now there's all kinds of mapping projects that are getting a lot of funding. <laughs> and um, I, I think that's wonderful, but this was done on it, like just with our community kind of contacts and, and working with that. So I have hope one day, um, I'm, I'm in the process of working on a, a new map for the, the Tomva, Perspectives on Tomva map that I did with Craig Torres, Desiree Martinez, Cindy Alvitre, and Wendy Teeter, and Allison Fisher Olson. Um, so within that particular map itself, there's stories, but um, we used Esri's story map, which has changed a little bit now. Um, and we're looking at, there, there's just some great young indigenous cartographers who are doing excellent work. So we're looking at rethinking those, those forms as well that we take into account. So that's how it kind of came about. There's actually a longer story to that. I was out at Pimu or Catalino Island and that's the point where I realized that the American Indian community sometimes doesn't talk enough to the, the first peoples here. And as a Haudenosaunee woman, we were always taught as children to talk to people when you first arrive at a place. So when I was at Stanford, actually, as a graduate student in modern thought and literature, you know, I, I, I um, often attended and talked with tribal elders from the Malek Maloney tribe. I went to their Christmas parties, my kids enjoyed hanging out with them. And so we were always taught to be respectful to those first peoples. Thank you. Um, how, how could uh, students uh, get more uh, involved in projects like these? And, or how are they already involved? Uh, this is another follow up from Katie. Okay, we have a we have students that are involved, particularly with the Pacific Islander. They're very they're very into. It. We don't have many Tomba students involved. We just don't have many at, at UCLA. I think there, there's 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 one Gabrielina woman and um, another person. But um, I, I what I have actually worked with students on these maps. Um, some of my students are grad students in particular use the maps to outline their thesis. The one on Indian education was used to outline the kind of lit review on her thesis and such. So there have been, there was a water map up. It came a little outdated because so much research has been done on, on water. We're hoping if anybody wants to do a water map with us, 
of Los Angeles, that's a really important map to undertake. They can just contact me and, and we, can, uh, we can work something out if they'd like to. I know we need a new water map and with all the water resources in Los Angeles right now, there's such wonderful research happening. And especially as uh, places are revitalized such as the LA River, Bayona Creek in Culver City, there's so many water projects going on and revitalizing of these water spots often, I, I mean, I, it, it could do with a deeper map than what the, the city's kind of laying out at this point. Thank you. Um, Sandra uh, follows up and asks, uh, what have been the means of, and uh, mechanisms of developing young indigenous uh, cartographers? That's a fascinating question. It is. I don't, I'm not sure what has, has led to it. I know the Association of American Geographers has been doing a lot more with indigenous cartography and that spans GIS projects and such. I actually would also say that a lot of it uh, orients itself around environmental protection. And I just think our young people are very aware of environmental destruction and they're not happy about it. So <laughs> I would say that seen as a tool for creating awareness of that environmental destruction and indigenous stewardship has those tools. And so not, but as I said, mapping is always that precarious element where it can be dangerous too to map things, right? Not all, not all knowledge is meant to be shared. This actually led to a, another project that I work on on California Native Hubs using um, Merkutu platform. And that particular platform is so that tribes can have conversations in the digital world, but have data sovereignty over that material. So yes, I think the, the push for indigenous cartography is the tool of mapping is so important in laying out our resources, et cetera, et cetera. But having control over how and who sees that those resources is really key because there can be a danger. I mean, basically the, the Pentagon has a whole mapping uh, section in, in the government and they've They've pretty much mapped out all the indigenous resources. Our governments tend to know that. And uh, it's important that we have a different kind of knowledge about, they have the resources mapped without the knowledge of how important those sites are, nor, nor they, may they not care because it's more about profit and money-making than it is about protecting important research sites or animals that may be in that site that, that use that or um, traditional gathering areas to continue tribal culture and things like that. So I see a poll there because it's a tool to protect and save important um, places to tribal peoples as well and to fight against environmental destruction. Thank you. Yeah, this, this idea of uh, not everything has to be shared or should be shared is, is key. And, and I, I'm, I'm glad you, you uh, you know, interspheres that into your answer. Uh, the next question is from uh, Karen Wigan. Hi, Karen. Um, she says, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Are you aware of any similar activity, uh, public art slash public art in the Bay Area or further north up the Pacific coast? If not, how did LA manage to incubate this bold cultural development? Hmm. I, that's a good question. I do know that in San Francisco, I see the, I don't know sure if people are aware of the People's Guide uh, as well, the People's Guide to Los Angeles, the People's Guide to the Bay Area. Um, I believe they have some. Um, I've just recently, as of last week, joined the board on that, as has Laura Harjo, who's a really wonderful urban planner professor, Muskogee Creek woman. She's amazing. Um, she's joined the board as well. So I do see that some of this will be developed. They don't really do the, the kind of project, the similar project as Mapping Indigenous LA, which is really focused on deep maps and story maps, but yet it is a people's map of protest, activism, important sites for all different kinds of communities, biopic communities as well. So um, I do see some of that happening in, in the Bay Area. Um, in the Bay Area, one place to see public art and that gets sponsored is the wonderful work of Karina Gould in the Sigori Tea Land Trust. 
Um, the Score T Land Trust is a really, really important place in the Bay Area to find more of that knowledge and to really bring that out if, if you'd like in the Bay Area. So that's where I would start with Karina Gould's organization. And it's, um, you know, she's a Loney and uh, it's a, it, she has a reclaimed place with there and she uses, um, they have a shoe made land tax. I'll, I'll put it in the Sorry. In which they ask for donations, but they also consider it a land tax. So they're trying to put action between acknowledgement of words and they use it to sustain community and art programs. So to, to me in the Bay Area, that's one of the more important places I see that, that could do some of these projects. I don't think it's really developed into a cartography project yet. I'm not sure, but People's Guide uh, to the Various Cities and um, that She Made Land Tax. That's how I would answer that question, so. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rana. Uh, next question is from Heiko Moore. Um, he asks, what struck me is the use of indigenous toponyms in this place-centered campaign to make Tong Tongwa land visible? They have real power. The toponyms re redefine urban spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, another landscape resurfaces, nudges LA commuters to think outside the box. Does a gazetteer of indigenous place names for the greater LA area exist? Um, I was just trying to look and see if I could pull up. I was gonna discuss River Garza's map. Um, hold, I'll put the link in the, <laughs> in the box, but it's on my special advisor page. Um, at UCLA, I commissioned a map by River Garzer. So it's an art version of, of this, and I'll put this on here, on here as well, um, of all the names of the village sites. But there's several maps. One of my favorite is the Heyday map that has all of, all of, uh, it has all the village sites that are known mapped. Um, there's over a hundred sites according to Desiree Martinez, um, and those sites uh, across Los Angeles, some are named, some are not. Some sites are village sites that are multiple sites in one place. Um, but yeah, um, it does redefine urban places. Part of the ways that I believe that it redefines them and the meanings of the names is it uh, shows water sites. So this is one simple way, way of thinking about it. Um, it shows places where water sites have been and are at. And so we can see the destruction of our water supply in relation to that. When I first arrived at LA, I used to say, you know, it was a desert or it was like kind of this kind of, you know, des desert is a word used to describe Los Angeles, but it's not, it's a Mediterranean climate and the impact of, uh, the impact of development and concrete and the expansion of the cityscape has actually led to all that water being underground. Even UCLA itself had an ephemeral creek that would come through campus and that's underground now. So as they sought to control it, because there was a life force and a life kind of ways of these creeks that would appear and disappear. And, um, um, you know, many of the Gabrielino Tomva are still very aware of, of where those water spots are at as well. So I, I think that the, the naming also really works for that, to think about that as well. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Candy Fujikani. She's actually one of our uh, panelists uh, coming up. Uh, she yeah, says, okay. uh, yeah, so uh, she says, such a beautiful talk. I love your discussion of star stones and the spiral between the ocean and the stars. Can you talk a little more about the importance of native mapping these relationships with the stars as opposed to the settler colonial ways in which the University of California observatories support the 30 meter telescope that Kanaka Maoli are standing against in Hawaii? Yeah. So this is a big issue because many of the indigenous communities across LA do not support the, the 30 meter telescope as well. Um, 
I, I can't say it's been easy being special advisor around that issue. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I will say is I do think that connection between the stars. So let me start with the, with the cogstones and the way that Mercedes uses them within her work. They're from a certain site and they're, they're an anthropological find. They're, they're definitely handmade by human hands, but the, what they're for is has not been retained or passed down like what those those particular what anthropologists call them cogstones were for so i believe you know the star stones is what um dorme renames them i think that's a way of imagining those relationships right that relationships to the ancestors and the stars um i can't speak to what the the tomva relevance is to that, I'm sure there's a deeper story or many stories that combine those star stones. So, but I can speak to what will what would happen if that native mapping rethought a relationship to land and the stars and the destruction that's occurring in Hawaii. Um, they're at the level of the UCOP level, the University of California President's Office. They have a commission on a, a committee on Native American and Indigenous Affairs. And one of my colleagues, Randall Akee, is uh, heading, they're trying to get built into the IRB, not just an IRB to protect people, but an IRB to protect places. And I think that's one thing him and I talk a lot about, you know, how to, how to, how to protect, how to, how to rethink, you know, these, there's these things that are also people focused in the university, but what would it mean to start to put into place an IRB that protect places, right? It kind of along the lines of uh, the UN Indigenous Committee or uh, uh, thinking about rivers, for instance, as beings and, and, and humans having equal protection like they did in Brazil or in other places. So, but the IRB protection of places is one way, in, that we can start to begin to think, what would that look like if we had that in an IRB? Randall Key is Native Hawaiian, so he's been thinking about these issues quite a lot, and they are up in front of the president of uh, University of California, so we'll see what happens. Stanford, I think, also plays a part in, in, in the 30 meter telescope as well. Pretty prominent, most prominent universities do. Thank you, Ms. Rana. Uh, I think uh, with that, we will uh, close out on the questions. Uh, we are uh, doing really well on time. Um, Ms. Rana, thank you so very much for this fascinating uh, uh, keynote uh, and uh, just, a, just a wonderful talk. Um, I, I want to let uh, all the attendees know that to be sure actually to uh, go and look at the digital exhibition, which we will put in chat uh, in, in just, a, just a moment. It's exhibits.stanford.edu slash blrcc3. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the maps uh, that Mishwana showed us uh, are on display there digitally. They're also available physically for the Stanford community at this point at the physical exhibition, which will uh, be available on uh, starting Monday. We'll open up on Monday afternoon. Uh, but we definitely have the digital exhibition and I encourage all the attendees to uh, go have a look. Uh, with that, we will close um, uh, a, uh, a huge round of applause uh, to Mishwana for uh, her wonderful talk. And uh, we will break um, now and start again at uh, 1030 with Contemporary Critical Approaches. Uh, with Edson Kranak and uh, Carlos Chavez, uh, which uh, it, it promises, promises to be an interesting uh, session. Um, so looking forward to that. See you all in a little bit. And thank you again, Ms. Juana. Yahweh, everybody.